Great, thank you. And this is joint work with Annie Lang at UPenn. So uh, the sort of big picture that our project is addressing uh, is the fact that consumer data that's collected from online activity and other sort of digitally tracked behavior um, is now being widely collected and used for various sorts of commercial use by different firms and different sectors. Um, as a result of this, policymakers have begun very seriously discussing different sorts of regulations of consumer data um, or the usage of this sort of consumer data in order to pursue uh, several different policy objectives. So the sort of objectives that have been the focus of most discussion so far um, have been just sort of straightforward protection of consumer privacy, um, transparency um, to allow consumers to know more about what data is collected and how it's used. And sort of related to these first two is uh, some ability or some measure of control uh, that uh, uh, regulators wanna to try to give consumers over the use of their data. Uh, and the focus of our project is uh, a sort of a new regulatory criteria that we haven't seen discussed so much so far. Um, and that is uh, you, the use of data in order to incentivize beneficial consumer behavior. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Uh, let me just give one prototypical example um, that will kind of thread it throughout the talk. Um, so one example that you can think of um, is the market for auto insurance. So in the market for auto insurance, uh, one of the predominant uh, kind of uh, observable covariates that's used to determine an insurance rate for a particular driver uh, is a driver's history of past accidents. Uh, now, because of this dependence of your future rate on your past accidents, uh, that gives drivers incentives uh, to exert effort to drive carefully, you know, for instance, by avoiding cell phone usage and by paying attention to the road uh, in order to keep their future rates low. Uh, and then sort of the question that we're focusing on in this talk um, is if auto insurance firms begin using new consumer data in order to help refine these rates that they're offering to consumers. Um, how is this gonna modulate incentives for safe driving? And sort of leading from there, how should regulators kind of view the use of this data and how should they control it? Um, so let me just jump right into a model to kind of frame how we're thinking about this issue. So our model uh, is gonna have N agents uh, who are each going to receive uh, service from a competitive market in each of two periods, T equals one and two. Uh, now, the way that receiving service is going to work is that when an agent receives service, so some agent I receives service in period T, that's going to generate an outcome. Um, you can view this as sort of a monetary outcome or it's a monetary equivalent. Um, and we're going to denote that SIT. And that outcome is going to be sort of a composition of three different factors. Uh, and so the first factor that's going to affect a consumer's outcome is going to be this variable theta i that is going to be the, the agent's persistent type. So this is sort of how good a driver they are in the auto insurance example. Um, the second factor that's going to uh, affect an outcome in a particular period uh, will be mean zero transient shocks. Um, so these are going to be kind of short run fluctuations in outcomes um, that aren't going to be relevant for forecasting future outcomes. And so these are going to be kind of drawn anew with mean zero every period. And then finally, and so this is the kind of the controlled variable that we're gonna be focusing a lot on in this talk, is that each agent can choose an effort level um, that will also contribute uh, to a good outcome. So that's sort of the, the basic transaction that occurs. Um, so that's how outcomes are generated. So this is gonna be a market where firms are gonna to compete to serve agents. And the way that we're gonna model this formally is that uh, firms are going to offer monetary rewards up front to the agent. They say, okay, if you come and allow me to serve you, then I'm going to pay you um, to, uh, to provide this service. Uh, that is going to, we're going to denote that monetary reward uh, RTI. Um, and then what the firms get out of serving the agent is they actually get to collect this monetary outcome that each agent generates. Uh, and I'll kind of map this back onto the auto insurance uh, example in a bit um, in, in case this isn't quite clear. Um, and so an easy result that we're going to assume that there are multiple firms and that they're all homogeneous. And so in equilibrium, firms are going to compete away all their rents and they're going to offer rewards that are equal to their forecast of an agent's outcome. Uh, and so in each period, uh, the reward that firms are going to offer to consumers are going to be a sum of two factors. Um, one factor is going to be this sort of uh, their forecast of the consumer's intrinsic quality. Um, plus a conjecture that the market has about how much effort the agent is going to put in. And that conjecture is going to be determined in equilibrium. Uh, and so the main difference between the forecast that the firms are making in periods one and two 
is that in period one, the firm doesn't have any prior information about agents. It just uh, is going to offer a rate based on their sort of their uh, prior expectation about their types. Um, but in period two, firms get to observe the outcomes of agents in period one uh, and potentially update their forecasters with agents types. Uh, now the one substantive assumption that we're going to put on the underlying distributions of the random variables in our model is that all the latent variables are going to have log concave densities. Uh, and so that just means that if you take the logarithm of the density of the distribution function, um, then that's going to be a concave function. So for instance, the normal distribution is log concave, but there are many others. And uh, a straightforward implication, sort of well known of this log concavity assumption, um, is that these posterior means are going to be increasing in the outcomes. So if an agent uh, gets a better outcome in period one, then that's going to improve the market's forecast of them in period two. And so that's going to improve the, the reward that they're offered in period two. Okay, so let's think about how this all feeds into incentive for effort. So each agent's objective is to maximize a discounted sum of payoffs in each period, where a payoff has two, in a period has two components. The first is the whatever reward that they're getting offered from the firm that they choose. And then they're gonna pay an effort cost for however much effort they choose to exert. And so we're gonna assume that this effort cost function is a, an increasing strictly convex function. Um, and that they have some discount factor, beta greater than zero, that's, that reflects how much they trade off future versus current outcomes. Uh, now the central trade-off that is going to determine how much effort agents exert um, is they're gonna to have to decide uh, how much do they want to pay this effort cost today in period one in order to increase the period two payments um, because as we saw on the previous slide, the higher their period one outcome, the higher the market is gonna assess their type and the more they're gonna offer them to serve them in period two. And so the balance of those two forces will determine equilibrium effort. Um, and then one thing to note here is that uh, this is a two period model. There sort of isn't any future to uh, entice agents to exert effort in period two. So period two effort is just gonna be zero and we're really gonna be focusing on these incentives in period one to exert effort. So all the effort that we're gonna talk about going forward will be in this period one of this model. Um, okay, so uh, that's sort of talk, that's getting a kind of baseline for how effort is determined in this model. Um, and now I'm gonna talk about uh, where kind of novel consumer data um, comes into play. So what's gonna be happening in this model is that just prior to time t equals one, um, the market is going to gain access to a new consumer data set that they're going to be able to, um, to use to make inferences about the ages in the model. Um, and this data set reveals that all of these N agents um, share characteristics that the market views as relevant to outcomes. And as a result, the market is going to view agents' outcomes to be correlated with one another. So I sort of told you that these outcomes SIT are the sum of these random variables and so far, I haven't told you about the kind of joint distribution of them. And this data set is going to imply that the market believes that the joint distribution shows some correlation between these variables. Um, and in particular, what this means is that this period two reward that agents get, um, so it's naturally a function of an agent's own outcome, as I already mentioned, um, but I also put in conditioning all the other agents' outcomes, and that's because of this consumer data set that's telling the market that uh, these outcomes are correlated. So the market is going to incorporate all of the outcomes from agents that share this characteristic uh, in order to, uh, to help forecast each agent's type. Okay, um, so we're going to focus on uh, two distinct kinds of consumer data um, that are going to link agents in very different ways. Um, so the first type of data set we're going to talk about is data that's going to link agents via what we'll call a quality linkage. And so under a quality linkage, the market is going to view agents as having correlated types, but independent shocks. So um, here I've written again this equation for, the, the, uh, the, uh, for each consumer's outcome. Um, and what I've done here is I've broken out the consumer's type, theta i, into two components. And this first component, theta bar, is going to be believed to be common across all the agents, and this induces correlation um, between their types and be then between their outcomes. Uh, the other type of data set that we're going to be think about, thinking about is a data set that introduces a, a so-called circumstance linkage. And under a circumstance linkage, the market is going to view agents as having correlated types, sorry, uh, uh, correlated shocks, but independent types. So again, I've written the outcome equation here, um, and now what I've done is where I've broken out uh, the epsilon IT into two components and this epsilon bar is gonna be shared across all the agents and it's gonna form a common component of their output in period one. 
Okay, so let's come back to the auto insurance example for a second, um, just to sort of uh, ground these ideas um, in a particular application. So in the context of auto insurance, you can think about all the agents in our model as drivers. Um, their types are gonna represent some kind of intrinsic driving ability. The outcomes are gonna be uh, insurance claims rates, um, or you can think about them as being sort of the negative insurance claims rates since better outcomes um, are higher. Um, and then effort would be the amount of care or caution that an agent puts into driving. Uh, and so two hypothetical linkages um, that uh, the market might uh, observe and might think is relevant to predicting claims um, or on the one hand could be a, a data set that reveals a set of agents are all parents that have young children. Uh, and so the market might view this as sort of a long term shifter to how um, well these uh, these drivers drive and what their accident rate is. And so that would be an example of a quality linkage. And another type of linkage that might be identified is a data set that uh, tells the market these are all workers that have just switched jobs. And the market might view that job switching as uh, imparting a temporary shock to outcomes in a particular period. So those are just kind of two examples that you can think of of what a quality linkage versus a circumstance linkage might be. Um, okay, so let me just uh, very quickly uh, kind of situate this paper in the literature. There are a few themes uh, that have been going on that are all kind of related to things in our paper. Um, so the first theme is uh, data usage in market context. And what our paper uh, does differently relative to the existing literature is that we focus on incentives for consumer effort. Uh, another strand of the literature uh, focuses on career concerns. So this is the idea that uh, agents exert effort today um, in order to enjoy some reputational payoff in the future. And uh, our paper innovates there by introducing multiple agents who have correlated outcomes. Uh, and finally, there's a, a literature on incentive contracting with multiple agents. Um, and relative to that literature, um, our paper focuses on so-called implicit incentives. So rather than a contract, um, agents are motivated solely by kind of the outcomes of future market interactions. And we also allow for very general signal structures. Uh, okay, so uh, that's sort of the, the setting and how we're thinking about how firms might be using um, consumer data. And so now let's talk about how these linkages uh, are going to affect equilibrium effort. So the exercise that we're going to be performing here um, is that we're going to compare effort when the market has observed this linkage to a no linkage benchmark in which the market is going to treat all outcomes as independent. You can think about this either as uh, sort of a, a pre-data environment where the market simply didn't observe the linkage um, or as an environment in which regulators aren't allowing the, the market to actually condition on this variable. And so uh, it's going to turn out that directionally, these two types of linkages are going to have diametrically opposing effects on effort. Uh, in particular, the introduction of inequality linkage is going to strictly decrease equilibrium effort, um, while conversely, the introduction of a circumstance linkage is going to strictly increase equilibrium effort. Um, so let me just take 30 seconds to tell you very roughly um, why this happens. So let's think first about quality linkages. Under a quality linkage, uh, you can think about other agents outcomes as signals of this common component of this type theta bar. So if you're trying to forecast theta i, these other outcomes sj are kind of, uh, you know, noisy draws on this common component theta bar. Um, as a result, they actually substitute for agent i's outcome as a signal of theta i, but now the market doesn't need to put as much weight on si for forecasting because it gets these additional signals of part of the type. And that's actually going to reduce the responsiveness of the market's forecast um, to changes in si. And so because changes in SI now don't have as much reward, agents are going to scale back the amount of effort that they put in equilibrium. Um, conversely, under a circumstance linkage, now other outcomes are actually signals of epsilon bar, this common component of um, the shock to the outcome. And so now other agents' outcomes are actually complementing agent I's outcome. It allows the market to sort of denoise this outcome and get a more precise, or what it views as a more precise signal of theta I. And that's actually going to increase the responses in the market's forecast, and that's going to scale up the amount of effort that agents are going to exert. Um, okay, so that's sort of the positive side of the paper, telling you how behavior is going to be affected. Um, now let's talk about the welfare side and return to this regulatory question that I opened the talk with. So um, it's going to turn out in this setting that uh, linkages aren't just going to affect behavior, they're also going to affect welfare. Um, and so that naturally opens a role for regulators to make decisions about what sort of consumer data um, may be shared and used in these markets. Um, and the, the particular exercise that we're going to think about here 
is a regulator writing a set of uniform policies that are going to dictate what sort of data can be used on the basis of how that data is being used. In particular, we're going to allow the regulator to either uh, permit or ban all quality linkage or all circumstances linkages, all circumstance linkages across a set of markets. Um, but they have to treat all markets and all data sets the same way. So they can tell whether that data is being used to sort of provide an additional um, signal of type or to denoise outcomes. But beyond that, they can't pick and choose um, what data is allowed or not. And so our result um, is going to say as a function of the uh, of agent's patients, um, what is the optimal regulatory policy? So remember that just notationally, we used beta to determine each agent's discount factor. Um, this is the trade-off that agents view between period one and period two outcomes. And it's going to turn out that the optimal regulatory scheme is going to be very different depending on how patient agents are. So there's going to be three regimes. Um, and you can just think about this as the inpatient regime, the medium patients regime, and the high patients regime. So when agents are inpatient, the regulator is going to allow circumstance linkages, but ban quality linkages. Um, when agents are very patient, where the regulator is going to allow quality linkages, but ban circumstance linkages. Um, and when the patient is intermediate, then the regulator is actually going to ban all linkages and not allow any additional data to be used to refine these forecasts. Um, so let me just give a, a very quick sketch of why. So um, if you think about how equilibrium effort is determined, uh, it's essentially based on the impact that agents can have on future forecasts. And, and it's not based on how it directly on how much the effort that they're exerting is going to change um, current outcomes. Uh, and as a result, it's easy to show that equilibrium effort can either be inefficiently high or inefficiently low. And this is despite the fact that firms make zero profit. And so all the effort is rebated back to agents. And the problem is that sort of the anticipated effort is rebated back. Agents don't, can't affect that. So they can only affect what's happening in the next period. And that drives a wedge between what's efficient and what's uh, happening in equilibrium. Um, and so what is critical for regulating how much effort agents put in is the discount factor. And the more patient agents are, um, then the sort of more they're willing to put in effort and that kind of drives effort from being kind of inefficiently low to eventually inefficiently high. Um, and so as a result, linkages are good for welfare when they move effort toward the efficient level. Um, and what our proposition does is sort of show under what circumstances different types of linkages move effort on average toward the efficient level. Um, so let me just conclude very briefly. Um, so just to come back to the, the big picture issue that I started the talk with, um, policymakers have begun thinking seriously about regulating usage of consumer data. Uh, the typical focus of much of this discussion has been on issues like privacy, transparency, and consumer control of their data. Uh, and our paper innovates by thinking about the impact on consumer behavior. And what we do is identify a non-quantity dimension of data um, that controls incentives for effort. Uh, so thank you for your time.